All right. So thanks a lot to the organizers. It's uh, really great uh, to attend an interesting conference, especially in this period. And um, today I'm going to talk about the neural code of abstraction in artificial and biological networks, mostly actually in biological networks, but uh, I'll talk also um, a little bit about what we have done in terms of uh, simulations. Okay, so most of the story is um, uh, in this paper that is on, available on BioArchive. And this gives me also the opportunity to thank all my collaborators, in particular, you know, Silvia Bernardi, who did the experiment that I'm going to describe in the lab of Daniel Salzman, and uh, Marcus Ben and Mattia Rigotti, who actually developed most of the theory and the theoretical framework in general. And this is one of the experiments that um, we analyzed and actually inspired most of what I'm going to talk about today. But I just wanted to mention that we see a very similar geometry in many other experiments that we are currently analyzing. And here, you know, I don't even have time to go over the list, but you know, this is a partial list of our collaborators and um, you know, it gives you an idea of how many experiments we already analyzed. Okay, so let me start with a very simple example because most of my talk will be about the definition of an abstract variable. And I'll try to introduce a couple of measures to characterize the geometry of the representations of these abstract variables. So let me start with a very simple example. So let's say that you live in this MNIST world, which is very simple. You have only four digits in this uh, particular example, but you have a lot of different samples. And um, of course, they're all very different. Uh, but if you live in this world and you want to rely on the regularities of this world to perform a task, for instance, you might realize that in some feature space, all these ones, they share property. And um, maybe you want to group them together and have a single representation for all these different ones. So that would correspond to a process of dimensionality reduction and probably what we can call legitimately a process of abstraction. Now, this is uh, one possibility, but what I'm going to discuss today is something a little more cognitive in which the groups are not dictated entirely by the sensory experience, in this case, the, the visual uh, um, stimulus that corresponds to a particular digit. But for instance, let's say that uh, you have a task in which you have to respond in a particular way when uh, one of these images corresponds to a digit that is odd. So let's say one and three in this example, and differently when it's even. So for instance, to two and four. So in this case, if you, for instance, decide that uh, you have a single representation for odd digits and a single representation for even digits, you're going to discard probably too much information and you will not be able to discriminate between ones and threes, for instance. So then if you want to group these digits in a different way, because you need to perform a different task, you will not be able to use the same representations. So what I'm going to do now is to describe possible geometries that correspond to different representations of this very simple concept, which is parity, whether a digit is odd or even. And again, I mean, this parity has nothing to do with the mathematical properties of these uh, digits. But uh, in this world, the only thing that the system or the subject can see is these images that correspond to these digits. OK, so I'm going to focus on this representation. So this is a firing rate space. Along each axis, I have the firing rate uh, of uh, an individual neuron. So F1 is neuron 1, F2 neuron 2, F3 neuron 3. And of course, in general, you're going to have thousands or millions of these neurons. So you're going to have a very high dimensional space. Now, let's say that uh, you show one of these uh, stimuli and you record the activity F1, F2, and F3. Uh, in response to this stimulus. That would correspond to one point in this space, and that's what I'm going to indicate here with this red point. Okay. Now, you can do the same for many different samples, and then you're going to have four clouds. I'm not uh, showing the clouds, but essentially, each point now represents the center of a cloud, and this is the center of the cloud of all the ones, these all the trees, and so on. 
And I'm going to start from a representation in which the centers are at a random location. Okay, so you just pick random F1, F2, and F3, and that will be one point. Then another uh, triplet that is random, it will be another point and so on. Okay, so in this particular case, parity is certainly encoded because you can discriminate if you have enough neurons, maybe, you know, this is a, just a simple case to visualize, but you have thousands of neurons, you will certainly be able to discriminate between ones, twos, threes, and four. And not only that, thanks to the fact that the points are in this very high dimensional space, you can easily separate them using a linear decoder. So for instance, you can separate the points corresponding to the ones and threes from the points corresponding to the twos and fours. Okay, so that would be essentially the parity hyperplane. And uh, again, thanks to this uh, arrangement of the points in this uh, uh, high dimensional representation, um, you can actually separate the points in any way you like. This is more difficult to see, but if you want to uh, somehow represent a different concept, uh, so let's say magnitude, you want to separate the small digits one and two from the large ones, three and four, you can do that in this particular case. And you can actually separate the points in any way you like. And uh, I want to characterize this nice property. And the way I'm going to do it is to use linear decoders that um, are trained to separate all different uh, dichotomies. So each dichotomy corresponds to one particular uh, grouping where, for instance, I'm grouping one and three together and the other group would contain two and four that would correspond to parity. Then it can have magnitude that would be a different grouping or a different dichotomy. And then there will be others that don't have a name, but you can go over all of them, all possible balanced dichotomy, compute the um, performance of this linear decoder, and then take the average. And in this particular case, for these random representations, you're going to have that the average, if the noise is not too large, is actually very high. And I'm going to call this quantity the shattering dimensionality. It's directly related to the dimensionality of these representations. And it's very similar to a quantity that we introduced in this paper indicated down here, Rigotti et al. in 2013. And we actually showed that in the brain you have these kind of representations that have very high shattering dimensionality. Okay, now this is certainly a representation of parity in the sense that you can decode it, but it's not special in any respect. And it's certainly not a representation that I would call abstract. It doesn't correspond to any process that is group, actually grouping together one, three, and two, and four. The points are just separable because of the properties of all these different representations, but there is nothing putting together one and three, two, and four. And so this dichotomy is not special in any respect and all dichotomies are equivalent. So if I want an abstract representation, I need to ask for a little more. And uh, for instance, this is the uh, Merriam-Webster uh, definition. This is the first one that says disassociated from any specific instance. Okay, so this is actually a very reasonable uh, definition. And uh, it would mean in terms of the geometry that I essentially have only two clusters. So one that represents the odd digits, it would be the, the red ones here, and one that represents the even digits. So I'm basically discarding all the information about uh, all the details of individual samples and even the differences between ones and threes. So for this kind of representations, you can certainly separate the odd digits from the even digits. It's clear by construction. But you can do more, and this is what is really the defining characteristic of an abstract representation according to us. So, okay, first of all, let me just stress that in this case, of, co of course, the shattering dimensionality is gonna be low because there's basically only one dichotomy that is encoded, which is parity. All the others are not encoded. But again, the, this has a nice property, and the property is the following that if I now train a linear decoder on a subset of these digits, so let's say only on one and two, 
I get this hyperplane. It's going to be slightly different from the hyperplane that I have here on the left, where I train the decoder on all possible digits. And the nice thing is that thanks to the arrangement of the points, this decoder will work right away also for samples three and four that have never been seen by the decoder. Of course, you know, in order to construct this representation, you must have seen all the uh, four different digits. But according to this decoder, three and four would be two novel examples. So it's a very nice and genuine form of generalization that uh, is one of the important uh, characteristics of abstraction. So, you know, this is certainly something that we have for these representations. And it's what we are going to call cross-condition generalization. So, you know, we have two measures. One is the shattering dimensionality. The second one is this cross-condition generalization. Okay, so let me stress that if you have points at random locations, as in the first example, then uh, you're not going to have this property. The points can be well separated as much as you want, but you're not going to have cross-condition generalization. So for instance, you play the same game here, you train a decoder on a, a subset of digits, so one and two, for instance, only on the small ones, you get this hyperplane. And now the points are at random location, so there is no reason why three and four should be on the right side of the hyperplane and uh, the cross-condition generalization performance will be really a chance of it. Okay, so now the problem with these um, representations here is that they allow for cross-condition generalization, but <clears throat> they allow you to encode only one variable, and we can do better in this high-dimensional space. So one way to do it is to, for instance, encode different variables in different subspaces. So in this simple example, let's say that uh, F1 is going to encode only magnitude and F3 is only going to encode parity. Okay, so now the points would be arranged at the vertices of a square. So this is an intermediate situation. It's not 1D as in the clustered case, and it's not 3D as in the case of random representations. It's something intermediate, and it has interesting generalization properties because now you have that these two manifolds that correspond to um, all the odd digits here and the even digits there, they're a kind of parallel and they're low dimensional. So now if I play the same game, I train a linear decoder on one, two, I get this hyperplane, that would work right away also for three and four. Now the nice thing of this kind of arrangement is that I can play the same game for magnitude. It's totally symmetric. So also for magnitude, I can train on one and three. So I'm training now a decoder to discriminate between <laughs> small and large digits. That in this case means, you know, whether they belong to group one, two, or they belong to a group two, three, and four. And this would um, work and generalize right away to um, the odd digits that are here. So two and four. So I have two variables that according to our definition based on cross-condition generalization are represented in an abstract format. Okay, so these representations are actually very popular in the machine learning community. They're called factorized representations or disentangled representations. And in particular, you should have a look at the work by Irina Higgins at um, DeepMind. Um, in which she uses beta variational autoencoders to construct these representations. And I mean, there are many people working on uh, uh, these entangled representations, but she's probably one of the very few who is actually analyzing also some real data. So that's why I wanted to mention her work. Okay, so now with these representations, you have these nice generalization properties. However, we don't really see these neurons here that are highly specialized at encoding only one variable. They're really a very small minority, if any. However, if you take these representations and you rotate them in the original high dimensional space, you preserve the generalization properties because it's a linear transformation and we are using linear decoders. And uh, now this has a chance to be compatible with what we see in the neural data. Okay, so one last consideration. So for these representations here, uh, 
there are clearly some dichotomies that cannot be decoded by a linear classifier. So for instance here, let's say I want to separate the mid-range digits from the extreme values. So in this case, two and three from one and four. As you can see in this simple example, they, they are arranged um, in, uh, on this uh, square, on this low-dimensional representation. And because it's a low-dimensional representation, you actually will not be able to find uh, um, an hyperplane separating uh, two and three from one and four. So this is equivalent to the exclusive or problem, so it's easily recognizable. But you know, in a general case, you're going to have that uh, for the majority of dichotomies, you will not be able to uh, separate the points. However, if you now perturb this representation, so you, know, you introduce these displacements in random directions in the original high dimensional space, it's very likely that then you will be able to separate the points also according to this dichotomy. And you still preserve to some extent this ability to cross generalize. Okay, so in this particular case, it's certainly true. Now, if you run simulations and you start from this low dimensional disentangled representation and you progressively increase the, um, the displacement uh, magnitude, which is what we have on the X axis, you clearly have that uh, for zero displacement, you have this perfectly factorized representation. So of course the cross condition generalization is very high. And then it goes down because then you move progressively closer to these high dimensional representations. And there is always a trade-off when you decrease this cross condition generalization performance, you increase the shattering dimensionality. And here, when you have a large displacement magnitude, you can easily um, achieve the maximal uh, shattering dimensionality. However, you know, these very simple simulations that are actually based only on eight points show that there is a very interesting regime where both the shattering dimensionality and the cross condition generalization performance are really high. And what I'm going to, com to try to convince you is that actually that's what we see in the real data. Okay, so let me show you the experiment, the first experiment that we analyzed uh, from uh, Daniel Salzman's lab. Um, so let me tell you uh, what the monkeys were trained to do, and then I'll tell you something about the geometry of the representations. So the task would start by holding a bar, then the monkey is presented with a fractal. Um, so it's a meaningless <coughs> picture. And the monkey is trained to respond in a particular way to this fractal. So in this case, for instance, the monkey has to release the bar. If it does so, it gets a reward. And there are four different fractals and four different uh, visual motor associations. So the monkey has to learn to respond by releasing the bar to A and C and keep holding to B and D. And if the monkey does the right thing, in case of A and B, it gets a reward. And in case of C and D, it avoids a punishment, uh, which is a timeout. Okay, now the interesting and the most co cognitive part of this task is that at some point, without any warning, we change the rule of the games, of the game, and uh, uh, basically we use the same stimuli but different visual motor associations. So now you see that the monkey has to hold in response to A instead of releasing, and also the outcomes uh, change in a kind of an orthogonal way. Then monkeys would switch from one context to the other, um, again, without any warning, multiple times. So the monkeys are really overtrained. They really know the game and they can perform extremely well, around 95%. And they can also uh, do some very simple form of inference. When we switch from one context to another, we know for sure they are not relearning because the very first time you present B here, of course, they don't know that we changed the rule. They're gonna make a mistake but then they can infer that the associations have changed for all the other stimuli. So the very first time you present A or some other stimuli, they can perform correctly and they actually do perform correctly. Okay, so now let's look at the geometry of the representations. So this is the decoding accuracy for context and it's in three different brain areas. Um, in the hippocampus, dorsolateral and prefrontal cortex, and in ACC. They recorded from all these different areas simultaneously, and you see they have a lot of neurons. And you see that um, this is uh, the decoding accuracy as a function of time, 
they clearly have, um, um, we can certainly decode context with very high accuracy, also in the interval preceding the stimulus, which is probably when you need to encode the context. However, as I pointed out earlier, the fact that you're decoding context doesn't tell you much about the fact that context is represented in an abstract format. So let's look at more closely at the geometries. Now, you know, we projected the data down from the 700 dimensions to three. This is the in the hippocampus. And the four points correspond to the centers of the clouds of the trials that are indicated by this letter. So A, B, C, and D are the stimuli, H and R hold and release, plus and minus are um, whether the monkey got a reward or not. And the yellow circles correspond to the cases in which the monkey actually got a reward. Okay, so you see some clustering. So, you know, maybe that's the way they're representing it. But if I now rotate this, you see that there is a lot of uh, structure here. So first of all, you see this, uh, two relatively low dimensional manifolds, these two planes that are kind of parallel. And also the points are very nicely organized. So the yellow points are all on the same side, for instance. Now look at dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. This is even more interesting because here, if you do any cluster analysis, it will not pass the test because you know, this distance here is larger than the distance between the two contexts. However, you still have that nice geometry. And it's very similar also in ACC. Okay, so you shouldn't take this too seriously. This is a projection in uh, three dimension, but you can do the analysis in the original high dimensional space. And the way we did it is essentially what I just told you at the beginning to characterize the geometries. We computed the shattering dimensionality and the cross condition generalization performance. And given that we didn't want to make any assumption about the variables that are encoded, and we had only eight different conditions, we actually tried all possible dichotomies. So we wanted to discover which variables are in an abstract format. So for instance, if you group the trials in this way, um, they would correspond to context one and context two, so that's variable context. You can group them according to whether the monkey was rewarded or not and that would be another dichotomy value. Or you can do it for uh, dichotomies that actually do not make much sense, but they don't have a name, but who knows, you know, maybe these are represented in an abstract format in the brain. Okay, so here now I'm going to show you the results for all possible 35 dichotomies. So these are in the, in the three brain areas. And the empty circles is the decoding accuracy for all the dichotomies. And the filled circle is the cross-condition generalization. So you see that, first of all, all these points uh, indicate that you can basically decode almost every dichotomy. Actually, you know, this is in the interval preceding the stimulus, so the uh, firing rates are relatively low. But if you look at other intervals, you can decode all the dichotomies. Now, the shattering dimensionality is pretty high in this case. And uh, the second thing that you can look at is what dichotomies correspond to abstract variables and they pass our statistical test that I will not have time to describe. So you see that context is certainly encoded in all the three brain areas and it's also in an abstract format. And then we have value that is always very strongly encoded in almost every brain area. And action is in an abstract format in prefrontal cortex but not in, a, in the hippocampus. But it's interesting because we can still decode it. Okay, so in the last two minutes, uh, you know, this is just an example. You can actually draw a lot of conclusions from this analysis, but I don't have time to go over all the uh, different uh, aspects that we analyzed of the experiment, but you can find them in the, in the paper. Um, how can we get this in, in a model? Okay. So we go back to this uh, simple example, and I, I'm using now eight different conditions. Uh, sorry if I can close the door. Okay, um, so now we have eight digits, and we separate them into odd and even. And now we train a very simple network, um, not using any of the sophisticated methods that are available now, like the, the variational lot encoders, but we just trained a network to report whether the digit is odd or even. 
And at the same time, we do it for a small and large because we want to see whether the network is going to represent two variables simultaneously in an abstract format. So now, if you look at this last layer and you do the same analysis, and this is also a test for our method essentially, because here we don't know whether we should get this geometry, but we know that if we get it, uh, the only two variables that uh, should break the symmetry are actually uh, magnitude and parity. Okay, so first of all, you see that uh, all the empty circles that correspond to the decoding accuracy, they're very close to 100%. And so the shattering dimensionality is really high here. And this is also telling you that if you just stop here with the decoding analysis, you will not be able to tell what the network is trained to do. Now, if you look at the cross-condition generalization performance, you see that there are two, only two dichotomies that are really different from chance. The first one actually corresponds to um, parity, and the second one corresponds to magnitude. And you see there is a very nice gap between the first two and all the other dichotomies. Now, the nice thing here is that we are just analyzing the neural activity. We are not considering uh, at all the behavior of the network. Basically, you know, I passed to Marcus Benna just the neural representations in the last layer, and I asked him, uh, what are the what is the network doing? What are the um, uh, actual um, dichotomies that uh, the network is working on that, the, that they are represented in this uh, particular format? Okay, so I think I'm running out of time. So I'll, I'll stop here. Th these slides, you know, I would show you that uh, you can also do many other tasks, in particular the task of, uh, of the monkey. And uh, you can uh, use deep Q learning and many other techniques and you get a very similar geometry. So I would stop here and I'll be happy to take any question. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Stefana. So there are several questions. Okay, maybe, the, uh, okay, so the first question is by Tom Burns. What percentage of the variance is explained by low dimensional projections of the neural data for hippocampus, which you showed? Yeah, it's about 80%. Okay, and also the second question from Tom Burns is, your methods assumes linear separability and rate coding. Do... Yes, it does. And uh, I mean, it, you know, this, this is very similar. Uh, it's a problem that you have when you analyze this data. And it's very similar to the problem that we already encountered when we analyzed R. Miller's data in the 2013 paper. So you need to make an assumption about the readout and the readout should not be too complex because if it's too complex, then it's not gonna be very instructive to do the analysis. So in particular for the shattering dimensionality, we know that uh, linear decoder can predict the behavior of the monkey. That's something we showed in the 2013 paper. Um, but um, if you use a more complex decoder, then you will not be able to predict the, uh, the um, behavior of the monkey. So it's not a totally unreasonable assumption, but it is a strong assumption. I agree about that. And uh, in principle, the methods can be extended to more complex uh, decoders. And there is another question by Tanya Handel. Yeah, Stefan, thank you for the beautiful talk. Um, I wondered if this theory can be extended beyond classification to something like abstract rules, for example, same versus different rule, which we can apply to any stimuli. Would this uh, kind of uh, rule or any other abstract rule imply anything about what is a good neural representation for such abstract rule operations? Yeah, so, you know, we are investigating now what kind of uh, task would benefit from these kind of representations. The fact that we are using a classifier is only to characterize the geometry, but it doesn't necessarily map on a particular task. So if you look at the literature on disentangled representations, then you see a lot of different applications. So, you know, given that the representations have the properties that can be described as factorized or in terms of our uh, measure, then uh, you can do something with them. And uh, for instance, you can do transfer learning or, or many other things. But yeah, you're totally right that at some point we need to show 
in more complex tasks, also in the experiments, that there are, these representations are actually important for some kind of a completely novel behavior. And that's something we're still working on. Okay, uh, thank you. Again, thank you for the wonderful talk. So unfortunately, we ran out of time. So uh, if there are more questions, they probably should be answered offline in chat or something.